This is a free podcast from the BBC. For more information, you can go to our website, bbc.co.uk slash radio2. Here's a story that's going to linger in your memory. OK. I love this story. OK. Uh, you know when... Uh, do you drive... Do you let your wife drive? Yes, we talked about this, and yeah. I don't, I'm not a big fan. You're not a big fan, I'm not a big fan. No. It's partly, it's the whole kind of remote control thing at home as well. The man yeah. likes to be in charge. Yes. Okay? My wife, you know, she sometimes fumbles for things while driving. She'll look for lipstick, she'll look for something, else. I don't know what she's looking mm. for, you know, cash, you know, stuff, sweets she's lost down the years ago, mm. pictures of the children, yeah. you know, wigs, anything she can find in the yeah. car. She's got it in And is she side. looking down without looking at the road? No, no, she's driving along, one foot here, trying to put a shoe on with the other, reaching down with the other hand, you know. <laughs> that How many hands has she got? About eight. I'm exaggerating, obviously. But you know what yes. I mean? Sometimes when you're sitting there and you've got yeah. your foot pressing forward and the, the yeah. brake... Yeah. And, then, and then you do the accelerator, the fake mm. accelerator. Get out now, it's loads of time. <laughs> She's always telling me off for crossing the road when cars are coming. I said, there's loads of time. If you, yeah. move, if you went when I said, we'd be over. <laughs> OK. Um, anyway, here's something which I've never seen her do in the car, I'm quite okay. pleased to say, but I'd quite like to have been a witness to this. Right. A woman driver crashed her car yes. in Florida because okay. she was doing something, a little bit of personal grooming. What do you think she could have been doing in the car that caused her to crash? Waxing! Very close. She was shaving, shaving her, her bikini l- line. <laughs> wow. Let that sink in for a second. Mm. How do you even do that when you're driving? Whoa. How do you even do that? Why would you even do that? Surely one slip and whoa. <laughs> even with a safety razor, yeah. that's not wise, is mm. it? Shaving the bikini line. She was 37. You think she'd know better. <laughs> she told the police she was on her way to see her boyfriend. She wanted to be ready. <laughs> Quick do things happen in Florida that you <laughs> <laughs> on the way in the mm, car. Yeah. I'm hoping it was a convertible, get a bit of sun on you as well. <laughs> even at those tan lines. Iggy Pop drives around stark naked. Yeah, he told us. He this, drives he? around stark naked. If you're in Florida and you see Iggy Pop, don't lean into the window. <laughs> no. He apparently has a flannel with him that he puts over his privates just in case someone does lean in. Yeah. But he drives around imagine that. Mm, of that. all the of all the people you can see naked in a car, long, Iggy Pop probably isn't top of your list, does he? No. Jonathan Ross, online, on digital, and on 88 to 91 FM, BBC Radio 2. Do you believe in ghosts? No, of course not. What do you mean, of course not? A lot of people do. No, no, no. I don't either. I'd love them to be, I'd love mm. them to be real ghosts, wouldn't yeah. you? I'd love it. Proper real ghosts, you know, probably all dressed up like with pirates. A ball, with a ball and chain. Yeah. Yeah, like Blackbeard's ghost yeah. in a Disney film, clanking exactly. around and then helping people. Yeah, not just someone in a sheet. Lifting up bad guys and throwing them through windows, mm. you know, when kids are trying to raise money for, yeah. a, for a charity. That kind of ghost. Yeah, that sort of ghost would be good. Would you like a scary ghost? Or like person? one of those ghosts you see in um, Scooby Doo. The proper it... Scooby Doo ghost. Yeah, no. Scooby Doo ghosts are always men dressed up. No, but they are men dressed up, but they all made them look. They look quite if you, good. If you want to see men dressed up as a ghost, I'm sure we could arrange that. <laughs> no, but you know where I'm going with that. And they were not quite with, good. They were quite convincing on Scooby Doo. They, they were a cartoons, b not ghosts. <laughs> I know, but they were quite convincing. You to were me. convinced by the veracity of the Scooby Doo. My son ghosts. at the moment is watching Scooby Doo, and he's convinced the lunar ghost is a proper ghost. Well, the apple don't fall far from the tree, does it? <laughs> eh? He's only three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, shows you in a bad light. Then. <laughs> Anyway, yes. two glass files containing, supposedly, allegedly, the ghosts of an old man and a young girl have been sold online. Okay. 935 quid. Uh, this uh, person, Avi Woodbury, said the spirits have been caught in a house in Christchurch, New Zealand, by an exorcist and then stored in holy water, which, and this is the actual quote, sort of puts them to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't even bothered getting a good backstory. No. Not some sort of interest story. It sort of puts them to sleep. They put it on just the chance. They bought it, and it's been bought by a company. Obviously, I guess they want to use it to promote them. Yeah. £935. So you've sold two little bottles of water. Yeah. For it's... 935 quid. Even every hand doesn't get away with that. <laughs> You're listening to the Jonathan Ross Podcast from BBC Radio 2. Here's a great story. Love this. Have you ever been to Romania? No. I've been to Romania. Been to Bulgaria, skiing. Didn't ask you that. I went to Romania. Just sort of, you know, just giving you a bit of... No one's interested. Just a little taste. I went with Chris Evans. Why don't you list all your holidays? (laughs) Just thought I'd Why don't we do that now? Is that what you're going to do now? No, I just thought... So I ask you something, you go, yeah, I went to Romania. You ever been to to, uh, Brighton? No, yeah. Uh, Like that, did you? Yeah, lovely. Okay, what about you? You've been to France? You've been to France now? I've been to France, France, yeah. Uh America? Uh, Yeah. Great. Okay. So Romania. Anyway, here's a Romania. I've been to Romania. Have you? I went and it was beautiful. Oh, beautiful. Was it? Food was terrible, but it itself was beautiful. Is that where you uh, me met Ian Jury? Was that all the them forests and the cheeky girls? Yeah. <laughs> Lovely forests. Really? Um, anyway, but they but they do like the people I met there. Certainly, yeah, love a drink. Okay, they love a drink. There was a very there was a local plum brandy right. that a uh, Catholic priest shared with me. Okay, yeah, there's a story right there. You know, like one of those old style Orthodox. Kind oh of yeah, guys, yeah. Wore, big Ooh. beard and funny hat and everything. Yeah, and he had a little bottle tied to his belt. Did he? Oh, yeah. 
I think he was a rescue priest. I'm not sure. Maybe he went up like a dog. Maybe he went up when people were trapped in the snow and got him down. <laughs> a and... I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing because <laughs> my Romanian is is mm. rusty. Yes. <laughs> anyway. They've got traffic signs now. They've actually put up traffic signs by the side of the road in mm. Romania. Yes. Okay. Uh, in a part of Romania, uh, the place called uh, Pekicha, which say, attention, drunks. And look at that. To warn drivers that there will be drunk. <laughs> and there's a picture of a man on all fours <laughs> reaching a for a bottle. <laughs> it says, attention, drunks. And there's a picture of the man on his hands and knees clutching the bottle. And they've had to put it up because they've said, we've had to target the drivers because by the time the pedestrians get to this state, they're beyond caring. <laughs> Frankie, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you, big uh, I know you're, you, you've you got a talk coming up, but the book, I've been loving your book. I know we, we can't even say the uh, actual title of the book. It's My Something Life So Far. People can yeah. fill in a, a, a word of, you know, dissatisfaction. Mm. Uh, to, how much of it is uh, genuine, legit, actual memories, actual events? How much of it is embellished, enhanced, exaggerated? It's all true. That's kind of depressing, <laughs> yeah. then, in a way. <laughs> really? Because, <laughs> because I was hoping you'd say, no, I actually had a lovely childhood. And I'm a character. <laughs> he really is a character. Some things there. So, uh, Phil, people in you aren't necessarily aware of, where were, you, where were you actually born in Scotland? I was born in a place called Pollock Shaws in Glasgow, which is essentially Lake Devoid. It's like nothing. Yeah, and is that in the Gorbals or near the Gorbals? No. <laughs> Gorbals? Uh, uh, no, we right. started out in the Gorbals. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, our bit of the Gorbals was deemed too terrible to continue <laughs> existing. It was, and it got knocked down. Yeah. NASA <laughs> sent one of those little crafts in to see if there was any life there, didn't they? And then it came back negative. We fled from it like rats. <laughs> but didn't your father almost make you stay there? He was offered the opportunity to. Yeah, it's quite near his work. So he liked the idea of being there. Cause, and what did your mum have to say about that? She went absolutely tonto. <laughs> and then brought it up with him for about 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, that's the bedrock of a long relationship. Yeah, any time he would sort of say what, what he thought in any given situation, she would say, well... If it was up to you, <laughs> <laughs> we'd still be in the gobbles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, does the, so the gobbles doesn't exist as such anymore, or does no, it? No, no, it does. <laughs> so, so, well, to you, you're like some colonial general. <laughs> no, I prefer to think of myself as exist. I prefer to think of myself as David Attenborough looking in on <laughs> a, a, a different life. There. Uh, well, I've never been to the gobbles. Where exactly is the gobbles? It's it's in Glasgow. It's just off the Clyde. Okay. Uh, it's where the Citizens Theatre is. Well, look at me. I, I now think of it in terms. Mm-hmm. of You now think line. of it in terms of the Citizens Theatre. That's lovely. You, you know, come out sometime. I've been to Citizens Theatre, it's a good theatre. I will go out there. I went to, I, I've been to Edinburgh a number of times, but not just for the festival. I went outside of Edinburgh to various places where there were these kind of just huge council estates, the, yeah. the size of them which I'd never seen before. They were like, the, you know, it was like the size of Switzerland, one of them. Yeah. And it was a remarkable experience. Yeah, I taught it in one of those in uh, Pilton, Muir House kind of thing, and it's just, it's really like... At the time, it was really bleak. I think well, when I went there, this was about as bleak as it could get. And it, there was a there was a pub that people would go to, and the uh, the young ladies there would often uh, queue with their children to collect the benefit, and then go straight to the pub to celebrate. Yeah, <laughs> and, and stay there until either the money <laughs> ran out or a fight broke out. <laughs> to be honest, though, I'm so culturally ingrained in that I'm struggling to see your point. <laughs> well, I was there for a while, and I quite got used to seeing women punching each other while holding a pram with one hand. I mean, you, I kind of got used to that, and I know we're speaking of certain cliches, but I actually witnessed that. And but this was a long time ago. I imagine it's changed. It's been gentrified and prettified no, by now. But not much. But, but it's become quite middle class. There's, there's cappuccinos good... on the corner. And... Well, there's a line in like one of Irvin Welsh's books where he's talking about one of his characters. He's saying you know, in Estonia or something like that. He's going, this is actually one of the worst places in the world because if you're in Estonia or Latvia or something, there's probably like a cappuccino bar or something. Yeah, yeah. And look about here, there's absolutely nothing. It's probably <laughs> one of the few places in the world where there's nothing. I like the way that we now it kind of universally use the presence of a coffee shop that sells cappuccinos as the kind of, <laughs> this is now a civilised area. That's, that's become a kind of a, a, a standard, hasn't yeah. it? Knock the library down and put a cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, you, but you still live in Scotland, don't you? Yeah, no, I've, I've moved back up. I lived in London for a few years, but I just found it absolutely harrowing. And you came down, I guess, for, for work, for the comedy, yeah? Um, I would class it more as money. I came down to try and steal enough money from <laughs> English show business that I could, <laughs> I could live in Scotland high on cappuccino. You're like a comedy braveheart. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, uh, and so when did you move back? Uh, uh, about a year ago. OK, and so you're back now and you've got your family up there. Do you have your mum and dad still around? Yeah, yeah. So, you, so you're close with them, you're, you live near them? Yeah, yeah, and you know they pop around to see the kids and all that stuff. Well, that's it? the thing, that you can't beat that. You can't be having that kind of backup nearby. And I, I know a lot of people who move down here, that's what they lose. Yeah. OK, uh, how many kids do you have, Frankie? I've got two. How old are they? Five and a half and two and a half. I'm counting the halves now. That's nice, yeah, you're even doing the halves as well. <laughs> uh, you're going to think of having any more, is that it? Uh, 
I, I would say absolutely not, but then I know part of me always has this sort of thing of going, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you know, see... you forget the pain, don't you? Much like women forget the pain of childbirth. Yeah, yeah. What, what, hold on, what pain are you talking about? What pain is the, what, what possible pain did you have in, in bringing your children to, uh, If you had pain, you're doing it wrong. I, f- oh, I find it quite painful. Like, just the whole sort of, oh, I'm suddenly responsible for stuff, me. So basically, it was the erosion in your own selfish state that you're now mourning. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. Yes, all us men mourn the loss of selfishness when we have children. Uh, I've never seen photographs of your children. You've got any with you? Uh, no, I've got one. Well, uh, don't do it right now. We'll have a look in a minute, because this would be the dullest radio in the world. <laughs> we, unless, of course, I was allowed to describe them in a way that was both cruel and hurtful. <laughs> You're listening to the Jonathan Ross Podcast from BBC Radio 2. Frankie Boyle is with us, ladies and gentlemen, one of the funniest comedians in the country. So you're not doing uh, Mock the Week anymore at all? No. You walked off of that. Was that. And that was because of censorship issues? Is this the case, or you just got bored? Uh, a, b- a bit of both. You know, I'd, I never really enjoyed particularly doing it, but there was a thing where they wouldn't let me do the stand-up anymore, and I just thought, well, it's probably a good time to drift off and yeah. do something else. It was a lot. They used to do... Am I right? I think it was a very long record. They used to go on and on <laughs> and like on. like three hours. Yeah, and then they would use the stuff. He would basically get every <laughs> last ounce of comedy so he could yeah. put it on his DVDs, the, the producer-director guy at the end of the year. Well, it was, I thought it was, it was all right, like, but it's just that thing as well, when you're writing different stuff yourself, and I'm writing jokes, and I'm going... There's no way that you can put this on Mock the Week. Yeah. And if you're writing a few jokes like that a year, you're going, OK, I can work around that. But I was writing like a 100 of those a year, and yeah. you're going, there's no way I can say any of this. Because your tendency is to go towards the more extreme end of comedy, the kind of darker edge, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I don't try to. No. It's just I sort of try and think what's well, funny, and then whatever makes me laugh, I just try and think of a way I can sort of get away with. Yeah, yeah, but it is dark stuff, isn't it? Ah, it sort of ends up that way, it seems to be. But I've, uh, having met you, I know that you, you, you also laugh. You're a very generous kind of uh, member of an audience. As, you know, you laugh at other people that doesn't have to be that way. So it's not just that stuff that you find funny. I know, I've always thought it's like a broad church. Do you know what I mean? I've always found it weird that there's like all the sort of cheerier comedians sort of don't like the kind of darker thing because you're sort of like, well, who cares what it is? Because I came, I came out of clubs, really, mm. rather than sort of the Edinburgh Festival. Right? And there was always like different things. There might be a guy on at the end eating fire and being funny. And yeah, so yeah. like, I'm quite into all of it. So you see it all as being very much of the same school, even though some would say, OK, but your tendency is to go in this direction, as opposed to, say, Jason Manford, who talks about his nan a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could talk about my nan, but it would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I'd pay to see that. <laughs> Just that I like, I love Jason Manford stuff. It wasn't me being yeah. negative about it. But, you know, it's like you know what you're going to get from him, and I know what you're going to get from you. And so, right. I don't, yeah, I think it's all quite, you know, it's all quite, it's, it's all fair game, isn't it? I mean, apart from Michael McIntyre, it's all fair game. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Now, Michael does no. seem to attract a certain amount of. I don't know. Uh, a lot of comedians do seem to get a little bit bothered by him. Oh, that's just comedians, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah it's, it's just nice, you know. I it's a sort it, of envy thing, isn't it? I think. It's envy. Because yeah, yeah, he's he got so big, so quick. He's, and he's a very funny man. He's a very lovely man as well. Yeah. Yeah, but also, you know, terrible, terrible, vicious temper and, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. real weird sexual issues. And you never... You None of not, this is true. Probably yeah. you can't now broadcast you, you, this. You can't. <laughs> no one should dig up his patio. That's what you're sort of saying. Uh, OK, uh, so you're on tour. Now, will you please tell the ladies and gentlemen listening what the uh, what the uh, name of your tour is? It's called I Would Happily Punch Every One of You in the Face. <laughs> If I could, I would punch them all in the face. If I had time, I'd punch them all as they came in. I'd punch them all as they left again. <laughs> and this is just a, just a way of saying thank you. Just... Yeah. Well, it's a sort of personalised touch, isn't it? Well, you know, people are big on interactivity these days, and certainly yeah. that is interaction. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not just... I th- it's not going to work for the DVD, though, so the DVD I'm going to call... If I could reach out through the television screen and strangle you, I would. <laughs> <laughs> but your audience seem to like this kind of uh, approach. Who cares? <laughs> uh, uh, I'd like to go and see you, love. I've never seen a proper gig. Oh, I've never seen you do a gig. Uh, where are you? Are you doing London? You must be doing yeah, London. Yeah, I'll be sure. doing Apollo. Okay, let's have a look at some of the dates. You're in Glasgow, of course. Do you get a. Have you got a bigger following in Scotland? Do they like you because you're one of their own, or, or does it not really. They hate uh, me different? because I'm one of their own. <laughs> 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 but in that way, where they hate and like you. <laughs> they recognise you. There's kind of a grudging liking. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're down, you're doing. Well, you're doing all the kind of places one would expect. If you look for Frankie's tour, you'll see it online, I'm sure, and also uh, advertising in the papers as well. What kind of uh, what kind of size crowds do you play to at the moment? What, what, what sort of level are you at? It's like sort of 2,000 seaters kind of thing. Apollo's probably the biggest 
when I do it, it's like 3,000. And, and is, it, is it nicer working to a big crowd or do you prefer a smaller room? Oh, I find the, the sort of IQ goes down a bit in a really big room. <laughs> it's worth about got six a, IQ points. You've got to project more on it and it's a bigger space generally. <laughs> maybe, but it's also just that thing of there's some sort of dumb jokes that I maybe wouldn't... Not, not lots of them, there's like three or four dumb jokes I maybe wouldn't have in the show, but then I think... You know, let's keep all the monkeys on board. <laughs> <laughs> so they can stand. You love your crowd, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, this is... <laughs> no, generally they're fine, but the bigger the room, you know. Hold it, they're fine. That's, that's, that's the very definition of damning with faint praise. <laughs> generally, the people who play the CB, they're fine. But there's an honesty about you which is refreshing. Right, OK. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> like, you know, now, I try some, to be honest. There's some photographs in your book which are slightly alarming. Really? Oh, yeah. Of me? Yeah. There's one of you wearing a sort of silk kimono, doing some sort of oh, kung yeah. fu routine with, a, I'm assuming, a partner at the time? Yeah. Uh, I was Dr. Presley 36. My <laughs> pal used to do a character called Dr. Presley, who was like a sort of um, evil supervillain kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, I was Dr. Presley 36, which was him from another dimension. <laughs> and, <clears throat> so this was in line. front of an actual paying audience? This was like on TV. <laughs> You know what? I'm so going to YouTube for that afterwards. Yeah, it's, I can, yeah, it's probably not on YouTube. I'd like I feel, to see I feel that. like sticking all that stuff up. Oh, you should do, because people would like to see it. Because I've been enjoying uh, downloading the material that you were trying out for Mock the Week that you couldn't use on Mock the Week. And if oh, you yeah. do like humour, which is, you know, the dark end of the spectrum, Frankie is your man, and that's your material right there. But very funny stuff. It's interesting that these days, you know, there is there's an audience that will find you. There's places you can uh, distribute your work without it necessarily being censored. I think that's great for people, because if they can go and do the real thing, then... I think to some extent people who try to fit in in the media become a bit lessened by it because they're sort of training themselves out of being really great. I watched them um, Doug Stanhope's video the other night and because he's not got to worry about being on TV yeah. or, or anything like that, it, it was amazing. It was like a real thing of going, wow, this guy's amazing. Well, it's like Louis C.K. as well. I don't know if you're a fan of his. but I've when I, him. Oh, he's a terrific American medium, but you look at something that you couldn't use, sort of 70% of that act yeah. on TV. And it is, it does seem very, very honest, and I imagine it is, but it's, it's brilliant. And, and in a way, that is the perfect venue for it. You want to see it live, and you want to see it in a situation where you know everyone there is on board, everyone wants the same experience. Well, it's good. I think the internet's good for that, because people hopefully find some of these people. I've found, you know, like uh, Maria Bamford, have you seen her? No, nope, never. You can, if you see her on YouTube, she's uh, done these uh, wee sitcoms that are all sort of five minutes long, all about her having a nervous breakdown and going back to live with her parents. Let's it's, write these names down. It's, <laughs> it's literally some of the best comedy in the world. I'm going to have a look at that. Let's put some more music on. Frankie Boyle will still be with us after this. Radio 2. Do you play any instruments at all? I was listening to that piano at the end. I think that's a nice sound. That seems quite easy. I wondered whether Frankie's ever mastered any uh, musical instruments. None at all. I can't <laughs> sing either. You ever tried? I like to sing, but my children stop me. Obviously, I'm sure you get the Proclaimer tag, because oh. Scottish, glasses, borderline ginger. I'm, you you I'm, must get that quite a lot. I'm going, to try, I'm going to try and push my career enough so that eventually the Proclaimers get mistaken <laughs> for me. <laughs> it's going to happen. Although they'll always outnumber you, see, that's the <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, I passed one of them in the street once. I don't even know which one, obviously. But a moment. He gave me a very ugly look. Oh, like, really? He can't yeah. give any other looks, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, uh, I'd like to see you do something with them, perhaps a charity gig. All three of you come out and, and yeah. people try and guess which one. <laughs> That actually isn't the proclaimer. We, we all hide under cups and we get moved yeah. away by a set of giant hands. Find the proclaimer. Um, uh, Frankie, you studied to be a teacher, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, did you ever get to teach? Did you pass the... Uh... Uh, no, I did, like, the the placements, which was, like, 12 weeks of placements. Can I hang out? Really so you were at school, you were hoping, And what, what subjects were you teaching? I was teaching English. OK, and did you enjoy the experience? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I quite, well, I was quite drunk a lot of that time. Ah. So it wasn't that unenjoyable, but I was anaesthetised heavily. So is this because you were trying to create yourself a character rather like a dead poet society, a kind of rebellious, inspirational teacher, or you just had a drink problem? I was a serious alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, do you think uh, you would, if you'd have been sober at the time, would you have enjoyed the experience? Oh, I would have hated it much more. I mean, <laughs> that's the thing about alcohol, it's great. I mean, OK, I wouldn't have a drink again, but if someone told me I was going to fall down a set of stairs, I would take a couple of drinks. Uh, did you you, so and if you had a drink now, do you fear that you would get <laughs> lured back in? Oh, it's beyond that, man. We would just wake up in another country. <laughs> yeah, because that's what Barry Humphreys used to say to me once. I said to him, yeah. do people offer you drinks? Because yeah, socially, cause I don't drink, but I, I, I know I could drink. I actually did have a drink on New Year's Eve. had it about 10 years because my wife looked a little bit lonely and I said, yeah. I'll have a drink with you. Um, um, but I, then after I thought, I don't want to do that again. So okay. I didn't miss it at all. So I don't think I had that chemical thing that goes on in your head that, that alcoholics presumably have. 
Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> so you would literally, you would have something. What about if you had a cake which had alcohol and you didn't know? Would that trigger it off as well, do you think? I've, I've had that before and I've just spat it out. I just couldn't, like, I can't have any alcohol go to my body because like, it's like Dr. Jekyll, man, anything could so happen. So you just couldn't trust yourself? Yeah. And how long have you been sober for? Uh, 11 years now. 11, 11 years. years. And did you have to go, did you go through like a, an nah. Alcoholics Anonymous? You just, you I just don't believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. I know that's not very fashionable, but I just, uh, I just think it's a sort of, the whole 12 steps and you're always an alcoholic and you can never be cured. I think there's all sorts of different ways of approaching it and, and you know, people would be better taking up a hobby, I think. <laughs> Are there times though when you thought, okay, why did I, why, why, was, uh, why was I an alcoholic? Why couldn't I have been a sex addict? Because that would give you much better stories to look back I, on. I, I, don't even, I don't even count sex addiction. That's just being I knew being you wouldn't. Human. I, I knew you wouldn't count every, that as a... Everybody <laughs> apart from the odd freak is a sex addict. <laughs> and it's just something people... Men drag... You never see a woman go, oh, I'm sex addicted, I'm going to a clinic. It's always men go, oh, I've got a problem. The problem is I've got a lot of money and I'm famous. I've been sleeping with people. You'll be pleased to know that Frankie's new slide here on Radio 2, Ask the Doctor, will be starting uh, on Sunday evenings. <laughs> Phone in for a sympathetic ear. <laughs> You're listening to the Jonathan Ross Podcast. From BBC Radio 2. OK, well, now the exciting part of the interview, ladies and gentlemen. Sean, we've pretended to find interest in Frankie's life, his past, his autobiography, yeah. his new toy, in which he says, I would like to kill everyone, or whatever it's called. <laughs> it's some kind of nihilistic statement of intent. Comic books. Ah, yeah. ah now, we, now we get to the mother load. Uh, when, when, when did you first fall in love with comic books, and uh, would it be safe to describe it as the one true love of your life? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember in our school... When I was about seven, maybe six or seven, there was like a, a wee library and it's just all kids' books, but there was like, you know, a, a stack of old Marvel and DC comics. The actual which, comics, not annuals. The actual no, comic the actual books. comics. Wow. And like when you see those, like I remember one of them was like, uh, I think it must be a Kirby comic where it's like, the, uh, who's the guy in the Mobius chair? Remember that guy? Oh, of course I do. Uh, that was a DC comic, uh, and that was you're thinking of Metron from the New Metron, Gods. Metron, yeah, well, of course. And you know. everyone knew that. This is the start of this comic. Is Metron discovering this giant prison where all these titanically evil people, gigantic godlike creatures, yeah. have been imprisoned for all eternity? And they're on an asteroid oh, belt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think, he's sort of seen I think that might be New Gods Seven. It was, it was like, but as, oh, yeah. as a six-year-old, uh, it's absolutely mind-blowing. It's these are this is the greatest <laughs> literature <laughs> ever made. Um, I, uh, you know, my son Harvey is named after Jack Kirby. Really? The great, yeah, his name is Harvey Kirby Ross. I wanted to call him Wolf Galactus Ross, <laughs> but my my stupid wife <laughs> insisted he have a name that everyone could remember. Um, so yeah, and this has been a constant for you since then. Since you were six, you've always loved them. You, no, you... no, I sort of really drifted out of it, and then I was about twenty one. I was a student, and all all my friends just had massive comic collections. And my grant didn't come through one year, and I just stayed in the house and read, like, literally <laughs> 5,000 comics. So you see a slight blip in the system <laughs> altered the course of your destiny forever. Uh, and now uh, you still, do you do you encounter much? I don't really encounter much because I'm kind of, you know, obviously above criticism. But do you encounter, do people say to you, why do you read comics, a man of your age and that kind of thing? Do you encounter that kind of prejudice still or not? It's more like I get, I get flagged from my friends because I've got a high disposable income, so I will buy... Like anything, yeah. like Batman, Wonder Woman, Team Up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a silly bad book. <laughs> yeah. Give it a chance. Just anything, as long yeah. as it's a comic. Where, 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 do you, where do you keep your books? Are they are they neatly graded? Are they filed? Are they saved? Are they in bags? Inspired by you, I have built a library in my house. <laughs> <laughs> of comics. It's your very own fortress of solitude. <laughs> yeah. uh, and how, how understanding is your your partner, your wife? She files you? them. Oh, <laughs> she knows how to keep her man happy. Yeah, and she she would ask me things like. These come from the ultimate universe. Do they get their own shell? Oh! That's great. Well, that's a keeper right there. Where did you find her? Yeah. Um, uh, and does she, does she read the comics as well? Hmm. She reads some of them. Generally, I select ones yeah, for yeah. her. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there thinking, oh, they're the weirdest couple on the planet. Yeah. And a lot of people thinking, wow, <laughs> yeah. how did he find that? Uh, and the kids, you're going to no doubt indoctrinate, indoctrinate them into the world of comic books as soon as they're old enough to fully understand and enjoy them. Already, already. Which, which yes. ones? You buy the kiddie versions for them? Uh, no, I, re I read them out. Uh, the, I read them out sort of very action-filled comics, but I just do all this sort of sounds. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. Bet, and also, so do you. <laughs> <laughs> I you love it more. Do you have any uh, regular books in the house, books that don't have pictures and word balloons? Oh, tons. Yeah, I read quite a lot of... So you like literature as well? Yeah, yeah I read yeah, quite yeah. a lot of non-fiction nice and stuff. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, and are you going to uh, dip your toe in the world of comic creation? I know a friend of mine, a Scottish uh, brilliant writer called Mark Miller, he's launching his own comic. He told me that you were doing a strip for him already. I would love to do a strip for him. But you're not? 
<laughs> not at the moment. <laughs> no, he's so he's me. created this fantasy. Hey, he's cre- he's all he's all about creating. <laughs> <man. That's laughs> what he does. Comic people though. Uh, do, have you been to any of the big conventions? Have you ever been to the ones in America where no, people man. dress up in costumes? That looks like potentially a really weird place to troll for sex. Yeah, yeah. They are, they, you do walk around and see these people in caves, and you think they're all keeping those clothes on at bedtime. I yeah. can tell. And also, you can you know get suits with you know abs on them and stuff like that. You could really go for it. Some of us don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the best one I saw. I, I, I tell you, it is worth going. The big one to go to is the San Diego Comic Convention. Is uh, you go there and you see um, bat, bat women, bat girls of all ages. Right. Oh, until you've seen an eighty-year-old bat woman, <laughs> you haven't lived. You really haven't lived. I'm not joking. I saw one coming in, and she was on the larger side as well. She was certainly the wrong side of sixty, and she was in one of those chairs that you get when you when you're just a little bit too fat to walk. And God bless her, she had breathing apparatus. <laughs> Now, I'll be honest with you, why bother with the costume? <laughs> she could she could fight crime, man. And just wheel herself into a warehouse by yeah. the docks and set fire to it. <laughs> on that note, Mr Frankie Boyle is leaving us, but ladies and gentlemen, you can see him on his tour. I would happily punch every one of you in the face. And his book, My Not So Wonderful Life So Far, <laughs> is also available at all tolerant booksellers. Frankie, great to see you. Thanks, man. Hey, Matthew McFadden's with us. Talk about a hunk of good-looking man right here. Uh, especially now he's taking the glasses off. He's a bit like Clark Kent. He came in with the glasses off, took them off, suddenly Superman. Yeah, this is it. Listen to that voice as well. A proper man's voice. <laughs> Matthew's on stage here in London's Glittering West End in Private Lives, uh, London's Vaudeville Theatre, with the gorgeous Kim Cattrall, her What Is In Sex On The City. Mm. Uh, and... Fabulous reviews. I don't think I've seen such positive reviews across the board for a show uh, for years. I mean, you must be delighted. Yeah, relieved, more than anything. It feels uh, Yeah, we we had two weeks in Bath, and then we came in, and then everyone was terrible. Because we'd done 20 shows before the press night, so press night is this terrible, nervous So you felt thing, fairly comfortable know. with the yeah, performance. Yeah, but then you but... never really know what they're, how they're going to react. You know? so is, there, is, is there a chance that pressure would might get you to deliver the worst performance of the 20, just because you're... Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. That's the fear. Yeah. You, yeah. The sort uh, of useless nerves that you have. It's one of those plays which relies very heavily on the on-stage chemistry mm. between the leads. Is that something you can fake? Uh, if you didn't get on with the person, are you a good enough actor to be able to sort of create that? Or is it something where you really do need to get on with the person to, to make that feel real for the audience? I, th- I tend to think that if you're acting well enough, the chemistry will be there. Whether you like, Because I'm sure there have been great partnerships where they don't necessarily like each other. I'm lucky because I like Kim. Mm. I hope she likes me. But I think good chemistry is good acting and it means you're sort of working well together. So, And I suppose also if a play is well enough written, then yeah. the characters have a believable chemistry due to the way they are presented anyway. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, what kind of audiences do you get for it? Because here you're putting on a, a play, a classic, of course, but it's uh, first appeared in like the late 20s, I think. Yeah, it, even though it's... Yeah, it was yeah it was late 20s. It doesn't feel dusty at all. It feels incredibly modern. Um, I'm, I'm very perceptive about men and women. Incredibly, yeah, the, the idea that they... It's this couple who can't stand... They can't live without each other but can't live with each other and they bicker and fight but they fancy the pants off each other and... And so it turns on a sixpence, like lots of relationships do. And one oh, yes. minute you're cosy and sexy, and the next minute you're smashing each other in the face, or you know. Do you, uh, do, when you're doing a play, like that do you base it on either your own experiences, the performance, or other people you've seen in such volatile relationships? I draw on all kinds of things, <laughs> <laughs> bits and bobs from yeah. here and there. But it's, but it's, yeah, it's the laughter of recognition in the theatre that we get. Yeah. People go, oh, you know, and the men, there's big guffaws from the men, and then they sort of. <laughs> so it's one of those ones where, and Noel Coward, of course, being the genius writer yeah. that he was, he actually, you're right, yeah. he pers- 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 uh, has a sort of uh, insight into relationships which maybe lesser writers wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, let me ask you about your film work because you've just finished, I believe, or fairly recently finished working with uh, the great Ridley Scott, well, mm. Sir Ridley Scott, I think it is, Sir, he is yeah. uh, making his version of Robin Hood. Yeah. Here in the UK, with um, the occasionally volatile, but I find him quite charming, Mr. Russell Crowe. Yeah, as uh, the thieving bandit Hood. Yeah, who do you play in the film? I play the sheriff of Nottingham. Oh. But that's the best part. Well, it, yeah, it do, it's not as good as it sounds. Oh. <laughs> I got this. I got the script, and I got very excited. And so did my agent. We thought, wow, this is fantastic. Because it was called Nottingham originally, so oh. it was even more exciting. Even better, it was basically yeah. your film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I smelt a rat and thought, this can't be. This can't be true. So I read there were five scenes. Four scenes. No, only four. Mm. But are they and four? And I thought, well, it's... Well, they're OK, but I sort of thought it'll be quick and it's Ridley and... Yeah. So, and I was... And I had a great death. Kate Blanchett was going to stab me. Don't spoil it. Well, this, we, oh, I had a great death. Ah. And then, of course, because these great big films, the script disintegrates, so you get more pages. Yeah. 
And then I wasn't killed by Kate Blanchett. I was murdered by Mark Strong, which well, is still good. Probably. Still good. Yeah. And then more pages came, and then I was killed by someone, a thug on, with a crossbow. <laughs> oh. so, so you went from Oscar-winning Kate Blanchett yeah, to, to reliable extra. and very talented Mark Strong to third bloke from left with crossbow. Yeah, like a casual <laughs> killing. Well, you upset someone on the shoot, obviously. <laughs> but then I got to the set, and I thought I'd be quite big, because I haven't got much to do and really liked it, so it kept me alive. Ah, uh, so don't uh, die. There's a lesson to young actors right there. This is it. Mm. Nothing's yeah. written stone. This is it. <laughs> Apart yeah. from if you're doing something like Private Lives, where you have to stick. <laughs> There's no changing that. You can't yeah. say, I've got an idea, let's change the ending. <laughs> yeah. uh, when's the yeah. film out? When's uh, Robin Hood out? I think it's May. OK. But, yeah. And have That's you seen the finished cut of it no, yet? No, I've seen nothing, yeah. So, so you're looking forward to that? Yeah, very much. Uh, how, is, um, how is Russell playing The Hood? Robin in The Hood? Uh, I'm not sure. Having, well, I, I didn't have that much to do with him. But he looks pretty impressive. Yeah. I, I mean, can't. Well, how could they make Robin Hood without the sheriff of Nottingham having mm. a lot of scenes with Robin Hood? This must be quite a radical rethink of the whole thing. Well, the, my sheriff is more of a sort of naffer than a baddie. He's a bit of an idiot, really. Is he slightly, just pu- pu- of, slightly public school? He's a little bit... He's, effeminate? Yeah, a little bit. A little mm. bit. A mm. little mm. bit camp, a little bit sort of twinkle in his eye. I've got a nice beard. I look like a demented Jesus. I've got a big... Oh, yeah. A bearded hood. Yeah. Uh, what's, could you give us a taste of the slightly camp voice that you're using for um, <laughs> no, I can't. No, I Come can't. on, you know you want to. <laughs> you know you want to. <laughs> I actually can't remember what I oh, said. Oh, look at the hours on him. Is it like that? Oh, come on. Oh, he's robbing from the rich, giving the poor. Oh, can you believe it? Come on, girlfriend. Yeah, marry on. Marry on. <laughs> You're listening to the Jonathan Ross Podcast from BBC Radio 2. OK, uh, Matthew McFadden, currently in the West End. Noel Coward's Private Lives is at London's Vaudeville Theatre. It's already being hailed as a hit. Everyone I know who's seen it has loved it. It's got great reviews. Mm. And, of course, you're opposite the great Kim Cattrall. It must be quite exhausting, though, because it's one of those plays which is uh, quite dense, the text, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of words and there's a lot of kind of pace to it. Yeah, it's very rapid. It's, um, yeah, it's incredibly... I've never been more tired doing it play ever because it's so quick it's so fast and uh you have you can't coast for a minute and so. then you go home and you've got the, the three kids waiting for you yeah so that's quite and they're, they're <laughs> yeah. young children you have aren't they how old are they again they're nine five and three wow. and my daughter's got into the habit of getting in uh bed with me and keely at three on the dot nice. in the morning that's good yeah. yeah so we either sort of go through the night with elbows and oh. knees and you know or i have to take it down you want to get a bigger bed but, yeah yeah, that's a thought. Look, I have my dog Sweeney in bed with me every night. <laughs> really? And he's what? well enough behaved to go down by my feet. Really? <laughs> what kind of dog is it? We've just got a dog. He's a Brussels griffin. What does that mean? It, it means he's weird looking. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but he's well behaved at bedtime. What dog have you got? It's called a, it's called a Coton de Tullier. I think I've heard of them. Yeah, very sweet. Like a joke dog. Look just gorgeous. Small? Yeah. Now, listen, Matthew. <laughs> mm. What happened to this movie that you were in with Rupert Graves and Daisy Donald and Keely Halls and all those people, which I never got to see, Death at the Funeral, because I remember it, when it's come out and I was looking forward to it, and it kind of didn't get released, did it? No. It what happened of, to that? It dribbled away. I don't know. I don't know, actually. You're Franco's I, directing. You've got a great cast. Yeah, a hilarious script. We yeah, had the and, most... It was one of those weird... It's, sort of, it's so out of your hands when you've done a film. It just yeah. goes out and that's into the ether. But it was a hoot shooting it. And, um, and they've remade it. Chris Rock has remade it. Wow. Well, that's what obviously was the element that was missing there. <laughs> Maybe that's what it was. But it's uh, worth an for urban work. comedian from the USA. Yeah. That's weird. They've Neil remade the it. Neil Butte has remade and it's exactly the same story. How strange. And it looks the same. Is and it's sort it? of shot the same. Is your version out on DVD? Uh, yeah, I think yeah. so. Well, let's track that down and we'll be able to compare it to Because I remember when you were making it, I was reading about it, I thought I'd go mm. and see that. And it didn't get the release, it didn't see. Yeah. Um, I'm quite jealous of Matthew. Why? Right. He got to play my part. Oh, here we go. Which one's this? Henry Not Wiglaf again. Henry the fourth. Henry, Henry the fifth. <laughs> you were Henry. You were Hal, weren't you? I was you? Hal. Yeah. That's the yeah. part. I, so I always, why do you want to be that? Because I, I always thought that would be. Because I thought when I years ago I thought I might consider acting. Yeah. And I learned. Well, Hal. part of one of the speeches. Mm. I couldn't learn the <laughs> whole thing. Enough. Now. It was too long. <laughs> but I thought I'd give it a go. <laughs> never happened. Never happened. Never even got an audition. He's great, Hal. It's the best part. Yeah. He t- he goes from a lout into being a. A psychopath, really. Will shine more yeah. brightly than that which hath no foil to set it off. Oh. That's lovely. That's See, quite that's moving. A little, yeah. That's yeah. a little... That's all Is I that all you knew? <laughs> that was enough, I felt. <laughs> <laughs> it's very shortened, Hal. Look, I'll tell you what, I'll offer you this. What? Put, you put on a few pounds, you be forced off to my Hal, Matthew. What about <laughs> that? Right. Yeah, we'll yeah. give it a go. I'll talk to Richard Eyre. We could do that. We'll get... Uh, yeah. Keely can come aboard. She can be my doll tear sheet for you. quickly. Yeah, Mrs. doll tear. Yeah. We're sorted. <laughs> OK. He can be the bloke who opens the castle later on. Is that it? It's one line. It's easy to remember. Key. You just come down complaining, oh, doesn't right. they? That's all he does. Yeah, lovely. Uh, but there, the, have you seen uh, Orson Welles? No. Oh, oh was it chimes at chimes at midnight. midnight. No, I haven't. 
Scribble down your address. I think I've got your address anyway. Scribble okay. down your address. I'll send you a DVD of it. Where have you got Matthew's address? Never you know you that? mind. <laughs> <laughs> I got it from his wife. Did you? You did, yeah. I did. Mm. Sends a love, by the way. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I said I couldn't possibly. <laughs> she was worried because she, she sent you a note and didn't think you got it for the She didn't send me a note. She never sent me a note. I think she did. It's mm. a naughty note. She didn't send me a note. Are we still uh, on? Yeah, we are still <laughs> on. Uh, Matthew, it's great to see you. I want to come and see you in private lives as soon as possible because I promised Kim Cattrall I'd come and I didn't come yet and mm. I really want to see it because I've heard nothing but wave reviews. You've got to go off and be on stage, I guess. What night is the night you have off? Uh, I've got uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday off. What? Hey. No, so hang on. Well, no, I thought you were talking about Matt. Sunday. Sunday's oh, my only oh. day off. Only day off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. blimey. Yeah, yeah. I thought you meant short break. Oh, that's a bit cheeky. Afternoon <laughs> off. Yeah. Look, I'll sign on for the show, but I'll do one afternoon a week. Who's <laughs> <laughs> he think he is? Liza Minnelli? <laughs> <laughs> Won't be the first time he's been mistaken for it. Matthew, great to see you. Take care. Give my love to you, Mrs. Much. And uh, <laughs> I hope to see you both socially at some stage soon. Jonathan Ross, online, on digital, and on 88 to 91 FM, BBC Radio 2.